Hey guys, it's Casey, and this was not the video that I thought I was gonna make. So this is totally unscripted. I'm just gonna tell you about what happened in the last like 24 hours. So I watched the Malice in the Palace documentary, and I posted it just for Am Hoops Plus members to see. And a couple of them told me, um, one in particular who's a minority, that one of my opinions in this review that you're about to see is racist. I didn't agree with him. I thought about it before I made the statement in the video. It's about the word thug. And so the media, when Ron Artest, Jermaine O'Neal, Steven Jackson, went into the stands to beat up fans who had thrown a cup at them, called those players thugs. Part of the movie is talking about how that was a racist thing to do, and I disagreed. Here's basically what my opinion was. Like last night, at, I was watching a summer league game, and Isaiah Thomas said that, you know, back in his days in the late 80s, people used to call those Pistons thugs and they were doing the same thing to the Pacers there in the early 2000s, and that that word shouldn't be used. And to me, I'm like, dude, those two things are not comparable. Why are you comparing your team to those guys? Because your team played tough on the court. That should not be called a thug. These guys went in the stands and punched people. Like, yeah. But, and so those things aren't comparable. Why are you doing that, Isaiah Thomas? And that was my basic opinion is that you can label this behavior thug-like behavior, but not the people, because I don't think any of us should be judged by our worst moments, okay? So that was my opinion. Um, and then this uh, member, this channel member, reached out to me and said, yeah, you don't wanna do that. And I was like, dude, no, 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 I'm not gonna play it safe, because I don't wanna play it safe on here on YouTube. I wanna be authentic, tell you what I really feel. I don't wanna like think about how people are gonna react before I say it. So I'm like, no way, man, I'm doing that. But, you know, I asked my wife what she thought. And she agreed with this member. And I was like, man. Um, and, you know, I thought, you know, it's not a good idea. Just ask my wife. Why? I'm white. She's white. It's not a great idea. So I called one of my best friends who is a minority. And I asked him. And he basically explained to me the exact same thing that this member explained. Which is that that word has been misused for so long that it now has a deep racial connotation and that you shouldn't use it in any context because it hurts. And so for me to ask my wife or myself, how does it land? We have no frame of reference because we're white. And when I asked, so this member who is a minority and one of my best friends who is as well, they both said it hits a different way no matter when it's used. I, I had to take a look at it and be like, all right, well, you know, some of the people in the media at the time calling Ron Artest, Steven Jackson, those guys, they may have meant it in a racist way. They wanted to use the N-word, but they couldn't because it's not socially acceptable. So they just had to say thug, right? And so for me, I'm like, oh, well, I don't mean it in a racist way. I would never use the N-word to describe someone. So I can use the word thug. Well, it's like, all right, that's great, dude. But then when you do that, that gives that makes it seem okay socially acceptable for all these people who do mean it in a racist way to use it so either i don't use it to stop those people who do mean it in a racist way or i use it and i and i allow those people then to use it when they know they mean it in a racist way and the people who are receiving the word also feel it that way so you know what i'm just not going to use it even though i just use it 10 times and the, I've changed my opinion. Okay, yes. And part, like a big part of this documentary is that, is them trying to get that message across to the viewer. It, I did not get that message. I mean, I got that that's what they felt, but I disagreed with them. But then after talking to friends of mine um, who have experienced that and been called that, I'm, I'm over it. I'm just not gonna use it and I get it. And I know that some of you are gonna say, oh, that's way too, you're being too sensitive, social justice warrior and all that. I've made a shift in the last year of my life where when I was growing up, I was super, super, super overly sensitive about all that. Um, and now I've kind of gotten into a place where I, I, I'm like, okay, what do I really think? What do I really feel? And I'm not gonna be afraid of the backlash. But on this one, like, it's not. I'm not being too sensitive. It's a real thing. And part of my defense was, well, look, I used to listen to a lot of Tupac back in the day. He loved to say thug life, right? Until I got that thug life tatted on my chest, even though it was on his stomach, but you can't rhyme anything with stomach. Uh, and so I'm like, yeah, what? I mean, Tupac uses thug all the, all the time, bone thugs in harmony, right? And someone pointed out, well, yeah, they also use the N word all the time. And part of that is 
Word. taking ownership of that word again so that we own that word and those people don't own that word anymore because they try to use it as a weapon. And so, you know, I'm thinking like, all right, why would they reappropriate the word thug if the word thug didn't hit like that for them? Because it does, right? So I, I learned something, you know? And so I don't feel like I was using it in a racist way, but if I use it, it allows those people to use it too. And they do mean it in a racist way. So I'm gonna show you now my full review of the Malice in the Palace. There are still some things I did, I did uh, not agree with, um, but I lifted the part about thug and now you know why. I'll be honest, I thought there was nothing new to learn about the Malice in the Palace, but this documentary actually changed the way I see basketball, seriously. But look, at first I thought, yes, the players were blamed initially in the media, but we've already heard their side of the story plenty of times. I was actually surprised though after watching it, but I was also really upset about all the stuff it got wrong. This is the first movie review on AM Hoop since The Last Dance. And you might not know this, but I actually went to college for movie production in Los Angeles. And that's what I thought I was gonna do before I started in TV covering sports. So I am totally down to review anything that crosses movies with basketball. And I'll give you my honest opinion. Yo, it's Casey, this is AM Hoops. Hit subscribe and notification bells and all that stuff. You know what, I'm actually really excited for this. I hope that you guys like this. The last dance was so fun in that summer when we didn't have basketball and it's kind of what kicked off this channel for a lot of people. So let's get into it. Now, again, I thought that I knew all about the Malice in the Palace. I have made videos on this channel about Ron Artest and Jermaine O'Neal. So I've researched the hell out of it. But I knew this doc would be good 30 seconds in. If nothing else, it was really well done. That's why I think you guys should see it. The editing alone is amazing, and they do a great job of telling the story. On to what I did not like about this documentary, and there was a lot. The suspensions were too harsh. Our test was suspended the whole season. Steven Jackson got 30 games. Jermaine O'Neal got 25 games. I'm sorry, but that is completely appropriate. Oh, the fans should be blamed too? Yeah, but the NBA can't suspend the fans. They can ban them for life from the arena, which they did. It's the legal system that punishes the fans. The NBA players had to go through the legal system and what the NBA could do. And at one point they make it look like David Stern just hates the players. Who got the suspensions? Players. Who took over this process? Sure. There you go. No, David Stern wasn't being too harsh. This had never happened before. And the NBA had a black eye on its face and he had to send a message. Now, recently there have been incidents at the end of last year where fans did get way out of control and the media was harsh on those fans, but you bet it would have been different if Russell Westbrook wasn't held back. Now, I understand that they did this documentary on purpose from the player's perspective. So of course they're gonna tell their side of the story but I wish the players took more accountability. I mean, I was disappointed they didn't interview John Green, the fan who actually threw the cup. He is the most unlikable guy in this entire documentary. I mean, at one point he's laughing about the situation. Did you feel bad at all when Ron Artest is flying up there and goes right by you and attacks the guy next to you? Oh, I felt relief. <laughs> oh, and that's just an idiot move but why not get him on camera today to see how he feels about it? And yes, he would be interviewed. I mean, he was in the Ron Artest documentary. And what happened after the Malice at the Palace was an awesome story. Ron actually called John Green at his house years later. He took him out to lunch and they both apologized to each other. It was a really good ending to that documentary that showed the shared blame between the players and the fans. Instead, this documentary just makes the players look like victims and it puts it all on the fans and says, yeah, the media went overboard. They blame the players too harshly, but you don't need to go all the way in the other direction and just blame the fans. The truth is in the middle. The players who fought deserved harsh suspensions. The fans involved deserve punishment too, and they're both to blame. Here's what I loved. First up, Player profiles, they dove deep on the main characters, Reggie Miller, Jermaine O'Neal, Ron Artest, Steven Jackson. I already had a ton of respect for Jermaine O'Neal. I mean, if you go watch my Jermaine O'Neal What Happened To video, 
it shows exactly why all of us should think he is amazing, but I respected him even more after this movie. I also knew, like all of us, Ron Artest had a screw loose, but this one line actually gave me goosebumps. I'm just 100% in. Test me right here, it don't matter. You can be the biggest gangster. This is where we go. I'll die here. They also go deep on Steven Jackson, which I've really never seen in a documentary. I already knew he kind of had a street mentality reputation, but this right here really painted that picture. Jack is a very aggressive person. We have a lot of similar traits. He will turn that volume up very quickly and tell you about it. He's down for the calls. But I will never look at basketball the same again after the Reggie Miller profile. They show exactly how tough it is for a veteran to lead a group of young, talented players. And we see that all the time in the league. Like every few years, there will be a collection of young guys who we all know are gonna be all-stars later on in their careers with a savvy veteran and maybe they can win a chip. Well, they show how Reggie could see the big picture. He had been through losses while these kids were in high school, right? And he couldn't get through to them how rare it was to be in a position to win a chip. I'm pleading with these guys. Get on the same page. I could not get them to understand the opportunity. I never listened to Reggie. So anytime he's like giving me leadership and mentorship, I'm thinking, what's his ass in practice? Now you can tell in the interviews that were done recently that the young guys can now tell how big that opportunity was that they wasted. But now I can see how tough a job it is for guys like Reggie Miller. I mean, recently, you know, you've had Chris Paul on the Suns, although that young Suns team seemed to get it. But what about Jimmy Butler in the bubble? I also loved the details of the fight. And we've seen this fight broken down a million times a million different ways, right? But they have this one moment where they show the cup being thrown in slow motion and it builds it so perfectly before it hits Ron Artest. It was so well done. My like movie nerd side of me just nerded out. Also, I had no idea that a cop ran up to Ron Artest with mace in his hand, and the only reason he didn't get him was because Reggie Miller stopped him. I was also really impressed by the pain Reggie went through not winning a title. They show now his teammates and how the front office also really regrets that Reggie didn't win a ring, and how it really hurts his legacy. I already knew there's an unfair stain on Jermaine O'Neal's reputation and how bitter he is about it, but the Reggie Miller part was really emotional. Special, man. People don't understand. It's special. It is. For 18 years, I've truly been blessed to be a Pacer and a Hoosier. This doc wasn't going for the truth. It was blatantly vindication of the players. But I did really like it, and I'm gonna continue watching the series. Actually, the Malice in the Palace thing was just the first episode of untold stories in sports history, so I'm gonna continue watching it on Netflix. Also, check out these two videos about Jermaine O'Neal's entire life. I am telling you, like me, you'll have a ton of respect for this guy and Ron Artest's side of things.